Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you for coming also wherever you are here locally. Obviously, that uh, takes more effort than sitting home. <laughs> and uh, um, well, um, I would um, just uh, I don't know how many of you were able to follow the uh, John Reynolds talk about more or less similar topics. And uh, I have been able to listen to that uh, talk by John, and uh, so I will take it from uh, a rather different perspective, maybe slightly more technical. So I would like to go into the technicalities of the uh, procedures that are um, involved into uh, oracular and uh, shamanic uh, sessions and uh, the, uh, what it means, uh, what the job to be an oracle or a shaman is all about and uh, where it took its origins from. <coughs> um, in ancient times, in uh, um, the oracular um, function or, uh, if you like, possibility, we maybe we will see later what that means, was very much um, common all over the world. We have a interesting uh, text by uh, one uh, Greek uh, philosopher, biographer, and uh, um, and uh, uh, author, let's say, who was a uh, Plutarch. Maybe you have heard about him. And uh, he wrote in. Uh, he was from the first century CE, uh, current current era, and uh, he uh, wrote a text called the, which in Latin is translated in the Defecto Oraculorum, meaning about the vanishing of oracles. <coughs> First century CE. In this text, uh, Plutarch uh, talks about the famous anecdote in which a uh, Greek boat with an Egyptian pilot, uh, while sailing past an island, heard a voice coming from the island saying, the great Pan is dead. Maybe this anecdote is uh, known to some of you. Uh, Pan is a figure that is closely related to oracular function in uh, old ancient Greece. And the message, the content of this, uh, you know, uh, this information that um, found its way to Rome, for example, and was very much uh, uh, and interested very much the intelligentsia in Rome up to the emperor. Uh, Pan, as I said, was not entirely a god, this is debated, but he was what they call a daimon. Uh, in uh, in uh, Greek, they are called daimons, and they are uh, entities, let's say, that are not Olympic gods, not Uranic, let's say, gods living in uh, heaven, but a kind of uh, hypostasis of the gods, and uh, a little bit lower in uh, in hierarch hierarch uh, hierarchically, um, because they are sort of meant to be intermediaries between the higher gods and the human world. They are meant to be sort of living in the atmosphere. <clears throat> because the higher gods, uh, as such, cannot communicate and have a, uh, a relationship with the human world, because there is no communication. So, they sort of emanate themselves into lower uh, aspects of the gods, which then can uh, communicate with the uh, humans. In uh, ancient Greece, the most famous oracle was that of uh, Delphi. 
and uh, uh, there it was, uh, I think, uh, a uh, intermediary was uh, Apollo, the uh, god Apollo, uh, was giving the oracle. But it is interesting, coming back to the Plutarch um, uh, text, or the Plutarch information, it is interesting to note that he says that Pan is dead, and that as a consequence of that, oracles are silent. Oracles do not talk anymore, do not communicate anymore. This, he says, is due to becoming weak, uh, to the weakness of the uh, entities which are uh, giving the oracles, these diamonds I was uh, talking about before. Mm, they become weak because people are not anymore interested in them. They do not worship them and they do not feed them with offerings and sacrifice and rituals. Ritual uh, feeding. You know, much of uh, ancient religion, and uh, this one is uh, true to this day in the uh, Himalayan area, for example, is a ritualistic or ritualized uh, form of nourishing the deity. I give, it's a dog or death uh, relationship. I give you something in order for you to give me something back. I want, for example, help for, from a certain uh, god and I offer a sacrifice. In ancient times, these sacrifices were, uh, were uh, violent, involving killing of animals, sometimes even killing humans. And uh, this was thought to be a way to nourish the gods, to empower them, and to have a close relationship of collaboration in order to uh, make the uh, world go ahead well. <coughs> so, uh, I just quoted this um, ancient Greece, you know, uh, oracular tradition, because I want to show that, uh, in fact, it was common all over the world. It was common in India, it was common in China, <coughs> and as a kind of an exception, it is still common in Tibet, in the Himalayan region. <coughs> the, more or less, the uh, ways in which the whole oracular world is thought of, the cosmology, let's say, of oracularity is more or less the same. So, what happens in a uh, oracular uh, session, let's say. <clears throat> so, by the way, um, I will uh, go through a few uh, examples then later, which I recorded in uh, the Himalayan region of Arunachal Pradesh. And uh, they involve a number of different cultures which are over there. <clears throat> so we will have uh, some visual examples and I like to uh, preliminarily apologize for the poor quality of the videos because these have been done more or less 2002 with uh, very amateurish equipment, so I'm sorry about that. Also I had a major hard disk failure, so I, I lost the originals uh, and I need to uh, recover them somehow. So, um, what is the tradition in, in Tibet? How does this, the, uh, the, um, the oracular tradition that is still existing today uh, come about in Tibet? <clears throat> so, first of all, we do need a certain kind of cosmology for oracularity to be possible. This cosmology uh, is concerned about how the world is constituted and who lives inside this world. Mm, of course, we have, for example, the surface of the earth, 
okay, which is kind of the middle part, the middle place. And we have the atmosphere. Okay. We have then the underground, and then we have some beyond, some place where the real gods live. Okay. So, in this um, generally tripartite uh, cosmos with the uh, world below, a surface and an atmospheric world, um, all of that, all of these places are inhabited. In Tibetan tradition, more or less, it is considered absurd that there is a world without inhabitants. For those of you who study Tibetan, um, it's called Nö um, and Chu. Nö is the container and Chu is the contained. The function of the manifested world is actually to contain uh, life, living beings. Okay? Mm, also, it is um, generally considered that um, everything has a physical aspect, let's say a bodily aspect, but to it also are attached more subtle aspects. We would call them uh, more psychic aspects. One of these, one example that might be uh, familiar to you is the, uh, for example, the mountain dogs. In Tibet it is very uh, common that the bigger mountain ranges such, such as, for example, the Amir Macheng, the Kailash area or the uh, Everest area or the uh, Kanchenjunga and so forth, these mountain areas they have presiding gods and they are understood in a way in which the mountain which we can perceive with our senses is a kind of the body aspect of what the, for which the god is sort of the psychic part and the mental part. Okay, the other two aspects in the body, speech and mind, tripartite uh, mm, structure of beings. So, mm, this obviously is uh, conceived of in the big, uh, in the big, uh, let, let's say, more or less macrocosmic world, but also in a more smaller, in a smaller uh, scale. For example, rivers have spirits living there, uh, ponds, hills, but also crossroads, mountain springs. All these places are uh, both inhabited by subtle beings and also have uh, attached to them a subtle aspect. Before Buddhism came to, came to Tibet, you might know uh, more or less have heard the story of how Buddhism came to Tibet and uh, uh, the main you know, artifacts of this uh, introduction was uh, from the tantric point of view uh, Guru Parmasambhava whom you see here in a unfortunately also not so qualitatively <coughs> Uh, image here. Guru Padmasambhava was a tantric master uh, considered to be considered by Tibetans to be a kind of a uh, well, a, they very often call him the second Buddha someone who has gone beyond the uh, suffering of samsara and who is uh, due to his uh, tantric realization more or less uh, completely free in the sense that he can do whatever he pleases with the surrounding world. And uh, um, he came from, uh, he was originally in his biography from Odiana, which is uh, nowadays we uh, generally like uh, sort of as 
sehr ähm, kind of, you know, uh, how you say, acquired uh, uh, fact identified with northwestern uh, India, which is mostly Pakistan these days, but definitely a, an area uh, of Indian cultural, uh, you know, base, influence. And uh, in the Indian tradition, definitely the world is conceived in a very similar way as it was conceived in Tibet. The world was uh, tripartite, the world was inhabited. There were many hierarchies of subtle beings from the Nagas below, uh, the Rakshasas, the Yaksha, the Gandharva, the Pishacha, and so forth and so on. Among them also the Pretas, the uh, spirits of deceased people uh, who were not able to dissolve themselves, uh, who were trapped in that you know, bodiless condition, but still attached to their previous life. So, let's say, the, um, uh, in general, in, they are translated as hungry ghosts or, uh, you know, how, how do you say in English, the um, troubled, troubled ghosts, something like that. <coughs> um, psychic, Mm, aggregates that cannot dissolve, like in usual, uh, usually happens uh, through the ritual of funerals. Okay, so the fu one of the functions of the funeral in these areas is considered that to dissolve the psychic aggregate of the deceased person. For those who, for example, do not have a fun funeral or die of violent death and so forth. They are thought to remain trapped in this, in this uh, middle situation, uh, which is not a bardo even, it is actually a, uh, one state of being uh, in itself. So, when Guru Parnasambhava went from Odiana invited to Tibet, he did not at all find a different situation there. Uh, not uh, a, a situation which was not shared uh, from the cosmological point of view. More or less, Tibetans, <coughs> the pre-Buddhist Tibetans, Burmos, had the same, exactly the same uh, ideas, had exactly or very similar cosmologies. So when Urbana Sambhava went there, you might uh, recall this episode of his uh, biography, when he went uh, in uh, all over Tibet in order to subdue, they say, in, in, in Tibetan it's called Dulwa, to tame the uh, subtle environment, the psychic environment, or the environment of non-embodied beings. And this he did in various ways, assuming various forms also. This one is one of the most uh, well-known ones, Guru Dojo Jolo. Uh, a wrathful form which he uh, took on in order to subdue these gods, demigods, godlings, that had, with the population, human population inhabiting Tibet, this relationship which we were talking about before. They were worshipped by the Bumbos. Um, let's call them Bumbo, the pre-Buddhist uh, inhabitants of, uh, of Tibet. Maybe we will have time also to uh, talk about that uh, later on. Mm. So by Burmo I mean those uh, uh, pre-Buddhist inhabitants of Tibet who had a specific, very wide and very complex 
uh, religious tradition, which involved also the worship of these uh, subtle beings, god, demigods, godlings, fairies, and all whatever you might call it, call it. So the idea is uh, Guru Sambhava walking all over Tibet, uh, subduing these these uh, uh, gods and godlings and so forth, and bringing them under the yoke, if you like, of uh, the Buddhist uh, Dharma. He overpowered them and obliged them to uh, respond, to be, you know, uh, bound by oath to uh, the Buddhist Dharma, to defend, to um, uh, be, become what they call Dharmapala, protectors of the Dharma. So this is one of the main um, operations of Tibet. He made a, uh, how you say when you, there is a, a swamp and you make it, uh, uh, you, you take the wall, is a, you know, unhealthy and... Dread. Uh, ah, well, that's Wait. nice. <laughs> when you... Yeah, yeah but it, it is, uh, you know, unhealthy, a lot of um, uh, illnesses are there, malaria and so forth, and then you, you clean it up and it becomes nice and good. Well, Disinfect. Yeah, yes, yeah, sort of. <laughs> Purified. Purified, yes. In, in, we have a word in Italian, it's called bonifica, which means that really that everything is made good. So, the, the, that is what he did in, um, in the uh, subtle environment. The, all the, the gods and godlings and mountain gods and river gods and so forth, who were previously worshipped by the Burmos, started to be worshipped by the Buddhists and started and were bound to oath by oath to obey uh, the uh, Buddhist practitioners. <coughs> so then uh, Guru Padmasambhava went on, and this is an, ex an extremely interesting, um, I think. The, the, the biography of uh, Guru Padmasambhava is really a mine of, and the traditions about Guru Padmasambhava are really a, um, a very um, key topic to understand really the tradition of Tibet. Uh, obviously, um, you, you, when you investigate the figure of Guru Padmasambhava, you should, it, it would be better to do a pre preliminary choice, and this preliminary choice um, should be taken between the idea of going after a simple human, a simple human being, which was a, maybe a religious practitioner, uh, but a normal human who then went to, to Tibet and was uh, became a little bit famous and so forth, and or distinguish it as a, or identify it as a symbolic cluster or a symbolic figure that uh, kind of exemplifies, explains and uh, teaches actually the, how the Dharma should be understood for the people after him. So, not going after the humanization of the, of the figure of Padmasambhava, but understanding him. And then it is, regardless of you consider that to be, his figure to be actually real, let's say, or if you consider it to be merely symbolic, that does not make any difference. But the, the key is really to understand what it means uh, what is communicated through the symbolics of his biography and his activity. In fact, one of the, of the uh, 
most important things to which he is related is the control of time. Mm, Gurban Masambaba's work, uh, or the work that is attributed to him, was to, you know, um, really uh, prepare the future for the land of Tibet, for the Buddha Dharma in Tibet. And this he did via many different uh, perspectives of the same operation. The key or the core of this uh, activity is obviously his hiding Termas. Okay. Termas are, you might you know better than I do, are a generally um, terma means uh, hidden treasure, something like that. It means something that is very valuable and that goes for a certain period of time into being disappearing, only to be recovered at a certain time in a certain place by some specific people who find it and uh, sort of spread it out in the, among uh, people. One of the ideas behind the Therma tradition is that um, Guru Padma Sambhava thought that the times were not right for him to give all the teachings that he had, so he hid some of them in somewhere with uh, accompanying uh, instructions for some specific people to discover them later on. And, uh, you know, also according to tradition, sealing them in some places and, uh, um, and uh, uh, entrusting them to certain protectors. Again, these subtle beings which, with whom he was working uh, before. Um, so the idea is, these termas are uh, something that is designed to come into light when the time requires it. Uh, some, mm, some teachers say, for example, that uh, some termas might contain uh, practices which are useful for certain illnesses that were not, uh, not um, prevailing in his time. For example, cancer, HIV and so forth. Some people say there are terms specifically designed to help practitioners who are uh, afflicted by these ailments. Uh, there are uh, teachings in the termas that um, are specifically um, uh, um, providing assistance for those who have, for example, um, mental, certain mental obsessions, certain characteristics that uh, can be overcome easier by practicing a certain, you know, terma sattva and so on and so forth. forth. But termas are not only texts, there are images, uh, for example, statues, uh, stupas, whatever. Or there are even uh, places, for example, the very famous Bayeux, of which you can see some pictures here, um, are in a way a kind of tab. Okay. So, to come back to our main topic here, in general, uh, termas are also designed to be uh, central in oracular sessions. Okay. So, in order to understand this, I need to um, sort of uh, analyze how and uh, uh, what are the characteristics that um, define an oracular or shamanic session? I will, I will say um, 
the, the two, oracular and shamanic, are extremely similar. And in fact, they work with the same uh, basic structure. But they have some fundamental uh, distinctions to be made. So, what happens in general? Oracular or, or shamanic session is, um, involves one person who is the key of all. And he is the person that we would call medium in the West. Not really getting the thing right. But uh, in Tibetan they are called Kuten, which means base... Uh, um, well, for the oracles they are called Kuten. And this means physical base, okay, or bodily base. Uh, for uh, shamans, in general, they call hapa, uh, meaning the one, the perk for those of you who study Tibetan, the one who has a relationship with the god. So um, these two are exactly the same, and they are people. Who are uh, who have a psychic dysfunction? They have a so to say psychic handicap. We are generally uh, lured into thinking that our psychic world, our psychic being, is unitary. Is we are one in terms of our psyche. This is somewhat illusory and um, it would be more understandable to um, describe the psyche as a bunch of different things. For example, memory, imagination, uh, rationality, um, feelings and so forth. All these things make up the individual and are sort of you know, wrapped together by belonging to the same thing. In general, uh, normal human beings are relatively closed. This envelope is relatively isolating the psyche of the person. But in the Tibetan world, it is, uh, and it is thought that clearly the psyche of a human is, or whatever psyche, is very much also interrelated with the environment. For example, if you think uh, how the, the weather, for example, is, um, is uh, uh, how to say, uh, is uh, uh, determining, yeah, or affecting your, if, you're, if you feel happy or if you feel unhappy or like that. Or, uh, what happens, for example, you see an accident on the road and you are shocked for a certain time, for a certain period of time, and this is understood as something entering your psychic, uh, your psychic complex. Okay. In in the uh, for what concerns the um, the people who have this handicap I was talking about before, they have a crack in their psychic envelope and it is instead of being relatively isolated or relatively closed it is open to certain influences so this op this opening or this door which they have allows for external entities which populate the environment to enter into their you know to be part of this group of functions that they already have in their, in their psyche. And this is what they call possession in Western terms. Uh, spirit possession or deity's possession. Mm. It doesn't make any difference from the perspective of the individual who is possessed. What possesses him? But in terms of the quality of what happens, it makes a big difference if it is spirits, like, you know, uh, environment spirits or spirits of the deceased mostly. 
or if it is the diamond I was talking about before. These godlings in, that are intermediary or are lower manifestation or are uh, some independent uh, deity of, for example, the mountains. For example, Gyalpo, for those of, the, of you who have uh, a little more fam familiarity with that, Gyalpo often, often uh, do possess uh, oracles. This um, <coughs> characteristic generally shows up when the uh, oracle or shaman to be is starting his uh, uh, puberty. His or her, obviously, they can be both uh, male or female. Mm, generally, in the Himalayas at least, uh, these individuals have a family history in which the same phenomenon happened to other people. Generally, for example, uh, the uncle, the maternal uncle, or directly the father of, or the mother, after they pass away, the son or daughter has the same manifestation. And it starts with a period of very intense mental trouble that often involves um, that the um, that the person goes runs away goes into the forest or into the mountains and has a few weeks of a few days or a few weeks of complete uh, craze craziness uh, complete um, mental breakdown and uh, mm, different traditions uh, explain this in different ways uh, for example the more tribal uh, shamans that are or um, the more tribal society let's say that uh, and live in these uh, eastern Himalayan areas uh, they explain that as the um, uh, the the psych, psyche of the uh, individual is kidnapped by these spirits who really take him apart, who um, break him off, uh, destroy him, only to reconstruct him later on. And from that point on, they will have, uh, a, or particularly one uh, spirit, will have a relationship with him that um, allows for, um, uh, for this contact, for this being possessed by the spirit. So after this, this period of uh, craziness, the person comes back to his senses, let's say, uh, and um, the rest of the village generally identifies him because it's a very clear sign of this uh, peculiar possibility we can also call it but it is more a handicap when we see that uh, later um, identifies it and he gets a certain amount of training now in this point, in this moment a differentiation happens. <clears throat> the one who is identified as an oracle, as uh, the one who has a relationship with the oracular deity, is uh, taken, let's say, or um, put into a, a curriculum, educational curriculum, towards relatively controlling his uh, ability. Uh, he will not be, um, he will be trained to uh, not be randomly possessed at any time, day or night. Um, so, um, the, the, uh, the 
generally Nima old school um, monastic environment will ritually um, intervene on his subtle uh, body, the prana, the channels and so forth, in order to um, make the connection with the deity or the possession with the deity as smooth as possible, in order to um, limit it only to specific sessions and also in order to uh, avoid for any other unwanted spirit to possess the, the person. For example, this um, um, young man here, well, at the time he was a young man. Um, let, let me show you where, where we are. I don't know if I should make it bigger, but let me... Okay, so just to, to briefly go into this, uh, this is the Arunachal Pradesh, uh, the state, Indian, northeastern state of India, which is um, east of uh, Bhutan, you might be familiar with that. Uh, here is Assam, and uh, the particular person lives in the uh, Tawang area where the Murpa uh, population lives. He is himself a Diran Murpa. So the okay. So this this uh, person here. Sorry again for the poor quality of the of the video, is the uh, current uh, Kuten for a local oracle that is found in this, uh, in this um, district. He, uh, the deity uh, which is the actual oracle, uh, here may be a terminological uh, comment uh, might be useful, Technically speaking, um, this one is the medium, the oracle is the deity. So it is the entity giving responses and possessing the, the, uh, the kuten, who is called the oracle. Okay? So um, this person, when he was, uh, when first, um, the previous oracle was, or the previous kuten was his father. He passed away. And he had, uh, uh, as a boy, he was a little bit more grown up, like maybe 18, um, started to have these this problems. He went crazy and then came back, and, but he was occasionally possessed by, uh, by different spirits, among which was his father. And uh, seeing this, the local monastery, Nima Monastery, uh, Kempo, Identify him as the next uh, Kuten for the oracle. So they, they, let's say, invited him into the monastery and he was uh, trained. He was uh, ritually purified and, uh, you know, his uh, subtle channels were, mm, we can say, purified in a way that only this deity would possess it, the deity and the assistance of the deity. You know, deity always have a, a retinue. And uh, in his case, there are four, the main deity and other four. Uh, the deity itself is called Karmatille and is a uh, sub-emanation of the main oracular deity in Tibet, which is Gyalpo Pehara. Okay, you might have heard, who is the oracular deity of Nechum and Gaton. Uh, I think Nechum sure, I'm not sure if it's also Gaton. Um, of these famous state oracles. We will see later an excerpt from one ritual like that. Um, 
the shaman instead, so the other guy who is not within a Buddhist environment, and, uh, but who has the same phenomenon, is less taught. He picks up sort of some instructions uh, to control a little bit or relatively his ability. Particularly, he, is, uh, he acquires the ability to self-induce a state of trance, which is the state in which he can, uh, he can communicate with the, with the spirits. Uh, there are two possibilities. One's, one is um, where two uh, possible um, way to see the phenomenon. One is that the spirits come to him and one is that he also goes traveling uh, among the, the world of spirit. Probably the two things are both uh, possible. The, um, another very important uh, difference is that the, the Kuten is trained or is prepared to go into a state of trance only when ritually uh, induced into that. And how does that work? It works with a, the uh, with two fundamental elements. First, ryth rhythm, rhythm music. Let's call it music, or simply a drum, which is uh, with a very precise, increasingly fast, with an increasing pace uh, rhythm played for a certain amount of time. But more importantly, the thing that is said to cause his trance, more uh, sort of, or if you like, the, 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 the cause that he, the deity is uh, possessing him is the recitation of a tango text. At a certain point, some master discovered a tema. Uh, in ancient time, the text does not say it, in fact. And uh, by the recitation <coughs> of this tema, of this text, the deity is summoned. The text actually says, um, starts off with the usual prostrations and so forth, and then uh, pictures a description of the abode generally quite, you know, uh, very tantric imagery, you know, he, this, this deity lives in a place where there are rivers of blood and pus and uh, it's full of rotting uh, corpses and all that. And the text describes this environment and it says from there, you deity, come here and uh, communicate with us via the Kutel. Come and live for a while into the, our Kutel. He can, uh, people can communicate with this uh, deity only by uh, having him taking possession of the means to speak, which is a body. So, um, this text is actually what has the power to summon the deity. And it, is, uh, it, has, it has been, as the tradition uh, says, generally composed and hidden by Guru Padmasama. It is the very text that um, sort of um, represents the power that Guru Padmasambhava exert, exerted upon that being in order to tame it. Okay. Another very important aspect of the, of the ritual is the uh, attire of the Kutel. Because this 
uh, dress and all the paraphernalia that he has reproduce the iconography of the deity. He is dressed up exactly as the deity looks in its iconography. And maybe we can have a look at, at a few passages of this. So you see he has a just normal t-shirt. And then there are few very important um, traits in this and uh, um, particularly he has a ring which he wears, wears on the thumb for which he needs a extra cloth to make it so that it fits then he has a mirror on the heart and he has a sword Now he is nearly... Okay, this is the, the Lama. I forgot to say the, that it's a particular Lama, or uh, they call all, everyone Lama here. A ritualist who performs the ritual to summon the day. Il Lama intona una preghiera introduttiva al rito, accompagnata dal suono dei cimbali, della campagna e dal ritmo del damato. That uh, hack is also very important. You see the, the hat does have three circles which represent the three eyes of the deity and uh, uh, it is thought that the deity enters from the top of the head. Yes. <laughs> Alcohol offerings. And uh, the deity enters generally the top of the head. And when he has entered the, the hat is tied very tightly around his neck so that it is thought that the deity cannot go away. We will see that later with the Nechun. This is his copy of the text. how he, what his feelings are. 
when he is going into a trance. So what he said is that the object of the senses that normally are, you know, in the foreground uh, start getting like uh, further and further away. Like he was saying, like in a tunnel, they were somewhere in the end of the tunnel and the tunnel got longer and longer and longer. And then uh, he, he described the, the actual experience that he had when the trance started as like when you have uh, turbulence in an airplane. When, you know, the, particularly when the airplane goes down, he, he says your heart goes into the, the throat. You, know? you, are, you have this feeling that like the, the earth is missing under your feet. And then, uh, slowly, slowly, he completes, completely loses any awareness of himself, like in, in deep sleep. And um, after the ritual, well, we can have a look at that here. So what the Lama is doing, he reads the text, the text describes the iconography of the deity also, how he is, what he, uh, he writes for example a, a black stallion and uh, so forth. And uh, he calls him lords of gods and demons. And uh, summons him to come. the lower, the surface, and the atmospheric. Yeah. 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 He's called Maharaja, which means, uh, which means that he is uh, um, yeah. See, he's also called uh, Zadu, which means uh, planetary deity. Or uh, demon, planetary. Okay, I don't want to bore you too much with this, but you see here the the. Eastern region of Tibet. 
Il resto della popolazione della Vallata parla di Aretto Monta. Lo stesso oracolo affermò in seguito di non parlare la vita di qui. And then there is a, a very intricate psychodrama that is going on. Um, he has sometimes uh, some of the from the retinue of the deity uh, are very wrathful and angry because, uh, as they said, he, they were not worshipped properly uh, in regular puja. And so on. So yeah, that is, this is the part where he uh, points the sword towards himself. And the people, uh, you know, uh, all afraid that he would harm himself. This one is 
an official video issued by the Dharamsala Tibetan government about a festival that is uh, held in uh, every 12 years and uh, on the year of the monkey uh, and uh, it involves the now I want to go into the specific place it involves the trance and uh, uh, you know, consulting of the oracles, all four so-called state oracles. These four are Nechun, which is the most, the better known, um, Gadon, um, and then two female uh, deities and Kuten, which are Doge Yudroma and uh, Tselin Chenga, in the presence of the higher lamas of available. In this case, the it's always the Dalai Lama and the uh, Yavo Kamala, which you can see here if you want to. Okay, so this is the medium or kuten of the Nechun Oracle. He's a very nice guy, very quiet and peaceful. And you You also interviewed here. Sorry for the. This is a Tsering Chenga. You see, she is already going to do So when she, the deity comes, first thing she does is, uh, she or he does, is offering a dance, a kind of a, uh, you know, ritual offering dance. And you can see clearly what the hierarchic relationship with the, between the two is. Lama sitting on the high throne and the deity dancing low, which in Tibetan, in the Tibetan world is a very uh, eloquent uh, symbolization of hierarchy relations. Then the oracle makes offering. So it is understood in these cases that um, that one is actually the deity and not and the person has not, no uh, position whatsoever anymore you see here he is starting to have the turbulences in the airplane and the assistant that one is the main one the one you see on, on his right side has to figure out the exact moment when the baby comes uh, which you can identify particularly from the breathing and, and tie the, the, <laughs> the head very tight this head is uh, really very heavy it used to be around 25 kg kilo now it has been reduced to 12, 12 and a half. The final touches for the iconography are put up and you see he has a huge mirror in the air and uh, uh, it, it is said that the consciousness of the person goes to reside in the mirror when he is in trance.
he is the main one, and you can see that very solemn. He's the main assistant. This is uh, um, Selin Chenga giving her response to the Karmapa in this case. And she offers kata in the traditional Tibetan style. Of the psychic world. 
because their job it is to mainly find out the uh, well they are um, people go to them to a shaman because they have a problem uh, it can be a problem of cattle a problem of health a problem of misfortune uh, any kind of things that does not uh, with which they do not agree um, they might try to solve it to, or at least to diagnose it uh, going to a to see a shaman so uh, the shaman first of all if he is one who goes into trance so who has this power or possibility to go into trance makes use of this trance to establish what the cause is okay and he, he goes into a trance without any support. He is the one who goes in trance. He is the one who sings the, sings the uh, you know, uh, jaculatory, can you say, uh, and plays the instruments to induce into himself a state of trance. So he is a kind of a long goal, a, a kind of a self. Uh, relying person. He generally has an assistant who is uh, very often a strange person, sometimes the idiot of the village, you know, every village has an idiot, and, uh, or even more than one. <laughs> 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 and who has this strange uh, ability to understand what the, what the shaman is saying, because he will also not remember what happened during his trance. So he, according to, to, to what the, the ideas around his function is, goes into the subtle world and try to see if there are some spirits, some entities causing problems to this person who came to him. So it is a kind of a psychic diagnose, if you like. Instead of being a physical medic, he is a psychic so, in, in actually, I, I personally tend not to agree with those who consider shamanism to be a self, uh, um, a stand-alone religious tradition, because it is simply a function. It is like in any tradition, for example, you have a medical part, no? Like, for example, in Tibet you have Tibetan medicine, in China you have Chinese medicine, in India you have Ayurveda and so forth. But you cannot say that Ayurveda is a religious tradition. You, you can say that Ayurveda applies the principle of a religious tradition to a particular craft, to a particular science. Okay? And the same is true for the shamanic world, where they do not have actually an independent or stand-alone uh, religious structure that is based on that craft. It is simply the application of a general cosmology and the, the, uh, of a few phenomena of the human being and the surrounding world that can be used to uh, produce harmony and well-being and health for the humans and their environment, for the cattle also, for example. So I do not actually, uh, I don't think that it is uh, a good idea to consider shamanism as independent. In fact, all over Asia you have shamanism. You have it within, uh, for example, within Shintoism in Japan. You have it in China, in, let's call it Taoism, if you like. You have it in, uh, um, in Southeast Asia. And you have it in uh, uh, India, in Siberia. And in the places where only the shamanism is now present, uh, we could think that 
only that part of a religious tradition survived, and the rest of the tradition was either absorbed into something else or, uh, or actually died out. Mm, like, it looks very much like that, for example, Taoism nowadays uh, quite disappeared, but Chinese medicine is still there. Or, if you like, all the, the traditions about uh, the elements and the Yi Jing and so forth, all these things seem more or less to disappear, while, while the medicine still existed. In the Himalayas, for example, it is quite clear that in many places there are uh, types of shamanism that clearly were included into the burn tradition, pre-Buddhist tradition. Some uh, shamans even call themselves Bobo. They really say, I am a Bobo. By the way, it is also, I think, wrong that to, to speak of shamanism altogether, because uh, in fact the only shaman is the one doing the, the trance or doing the rituals for this. I will come back to, to that later. I want to show you sh uh, shortly a clip of one Bumbo who is not using, at least not in this case, the trance. Maybe I should take this one. This one is a, a shaman, calls himself a Bobo, who is uh, living and operating very close to the oracle we saw before in uh, this part east of Bhutan. And for those of you who have a little bit acquaintance with Tibetan stuff, you will immediately notice a very strange thing. Hand. Yes, he has the bell in the right hand and the Vajra in the left hand, which is the, the contrary of what Buddhists do in general. Okay, then let me describe, maybe we can get to a point where, where it's clearer. Okay, so this is his, he's performing a ritual for. Uh, you know, the prosperity and the benefit of this household here. And uh, the, the spirits are summoned to sit upon, or, you know, I don't know, really sit is not really a good uh, maybe word, but in these uh, blankets here, you see, on the, on the wall. And then he has all different sorts of plates and bowls and stuff where he puts offerings to the spirits which come to sit there. Then he, he uh, okay. Yeah. Then he does some is a very ancient Tibetan ritual. Uh, most probably originally Bumbo, which involves a uh, burnt offering, offering of uh, uh, aromatic plants burnt in, the, in uh, uh, on, on the you know charcoal burning charcoal, and you can see for all again if you can see it, uh, the bell is exactly the same bell as the uh, Buddhist use, so he was. Um, calling himself a bumpo, but performing absolutely and uh, um, rituals that belong to the shamanic work, that have a scope, the scope and the purpose of a uh, shamanic work. These people never have the idea of progressing on a spiritual path. That's absolutely not their interest. Uh, for this reason, I don't think that, um, for example, it is possible to compare or to um, uh, assimilate 
a practice such as that of church, which many people do, which many people uh, maybe know, and uh, uh, which has been in the past often considered to be a produce or a, um, you know, a going into Buddhism of the shamanic uh, procedures. Because Chö is a practice designed only for the purpose of spirit, spiritual progress, whereas this is completely outside the scope and the idea and the world of the uh, of the shamans. Okay, so I I think I can stop here, and uh, if you have some questions, please. Uh, please. Yes. It's kind of fascinating when we receive the, the oracles. Uh, in fact, it compares a little bit with the oracle at Delphi. Mm -hmm. Because they discovered recently, you probably I'm sure you know this, but the, the, the oracle at Delphi proclaimed uh, oracular stuff sitting on a major fault in the Earth's surface. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you go to the exact place where the oracle sat, the constant quantities of carbon dioxide coming up out of the earth. Mm -hmm. It's quite dangerous. Oh, yeah. And you know, it's interesting to see also that the, the, the first oracle that you showed us, he has once again this mask and this hat which constricts the breathing completely. Yes. And also it's just, when people shake up this, also, this also happens when people actually run out of oxygen and the rest of it. So it seems that there's a common theme in all of this. So yeah. Really, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You have to constrain people's breathing yes. in a big way. Yes. And uh, one common question I might anticipate is um, because many people are accustomed with the South American, mostly shamans, and uh, uh, many people ask if they take any drugs or any you know, psychoactive substance to uh, induce their trance. Mm -hmm. In the Himalayas, that's not absolutely used. The only thing they use is alcohol, for which uh, really rivers of that flow <laughs> through their uh, mouths. <laughs> but that is is a normal practice in uh, in uh, uh, in those areas, in the mountain areas. People drink really like crazy. Also, there's, there's no air already. You know, it's high altitude. Yes, this, this is not too high altitude. Yeah. This is our, really the foothills of the Himalayas. We, we are in less uh, high, uh, high places. Nevertheless, it's like this one probably is around 7800 in altitude, 7800 meter, which is in, in the Himalayas. But um, I, I remember one Apatani uh, person whom I knew uh, who um, Apatani is another tribe you can find. I had a movie on that. But, uh, one evening we were in the, you know, having some food and also some obviously beer, and he, you know, made a toast and said, "Drinking is our tradition." <laughs> Which is a quite fair uh, statement, I think. <laughs> yeah, the oracle that's really famous in the West, apart from Delphi, is the one in Naples, the Kumai oracle. I just wondered if you've ever been there or you know, uh, heard any more. Yeah, there were several, but in yeah. fact, nowadays obviously it's not existing. They yeah. were the Sibylle, yeah. the Sibylle and that one, the Kuman uh, oracle. I, I don't, uh, I've not been there in the specific place. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot say really very much about that. Uh, but they are also in the Latin world, and I think that it probably, um, as it happened with Bern and Buddhism, it happened with the Etruscans yes. and uh, the, the ancient uh, Latin world. Uh, also, this. Traditions continued, okay, but not very long because, as uh, uh, Plutarch said, uh, they already died out uh, in his time. Although it was a slow process, but 
he thought they be, would become weaker and weaker and weaker. I think they sealed the caves there and everything now. I think, I, mean, I don't think you can go there. Anymore. They sealed them off? Yeah. Ah, it's possible. Maybe, so. Maybe they say they are no, dangerous. <laughs> Um, why does why do high lamas even like the Dalai Lama with their uh, perception uh, have to rely on a worldly god for any advice at all? Well, this is an interesting question. Yes, um, I'd say first of all it's tradition. In the sense that there are certain moments in which uh, it is traditional to also, you know ask the, the, um, the oracle on his response. Uh, for example, it is very famous, the, uh, the episode when uh, the Dalai Lama was uncertain whether he, was, he had to stay in Tibet or he had to, like, to, to, to escape to India. And there he, he consulted the oracle, who in the end came along with him. <laughs> and he said definitely you should go, something like that. And also, it might be a more social stuff, because everyone sees the oracle and everyone's supposed to see what the oracle says, so they say okay. No. Whereas with the Dalai Lama there might be some political stuff, they intimate the it's like in Italy, you have as many ideas as you have people. <laughs> so, there are often, you know, quarrels and fights and so So, if the oracle says, that's okay. So, on an information level, uh, the Dalai Lama isn't necessarily receiving new information, but there's other factors which make... Not necessarily, it, yeah. not necessarily. But, again, this is um, also kind of uh, tricky, a tricky terrain, because uh, uh, you would say technically uh, high lamas like such as those are omniscient, okay, they know everything. Nevertheless, they are also humans. So, depends maybe if their, their, their awareness is uh, in that side or in this side. <laughs> maybe. Uh, also, it is very difficult to say, because um, you might think, uh, according to me, a certain choice was wrong. Or uh, in the moment, in the short term, but then it turns out to be positive in the long term, and you have to wait and see. And uh, so it's very difficult to say something in, in, the, uh, in the relative world. Mm. Uh, probably the fact is that in the relative world uh, things are relative. So there is no completely correct things. Everything you do has you know, good and bad, uh, uh, positive and negative aspects. If you like. which, which kind of... Uh so it begs the question around the prophecy and about time. You mentioned time earlier. Do some of these oracles have some particular perceptions that can advise into... Well, I think for them, the time, um, time is, is different than it is for uh, humans. I mean, at least that should be the idea that um, the, the cause why they they can say something about the future. Okay. Also here there are different perspectives on the thing. For example, one can say you can uh, tell how the future is reading the situation now as the cause for the future. Okay. So if you have clear uh, clarity, you, you can read, you can foretell the future just because you can see the causes now. The causes which will produce the future later. Some say, in fact, uh, that uh, actually there is the possibility to see the future as an object of perception. And that is, uh, is uh, obviously debated and uh, one of the possibilities that is attributed to, the, to this, this uh, sort of they have a, a bird's eye view on 
the data. But the other thing is that it's also a piece of absolutely perfect theatre. And, you know, there's Peha hissing away, and the only person who can understand Peha's hisses is the Dalai Lama. There are so, a couple more people. The Karmapa also understands. Okay. And his assistant also understands. Are they ever, but they don't presumably work at the same time together, do they? Depends. Depends. In, in, uh, well, in some cases, the assistant of the Nechum, well, he is always there. Uh, you see, he, he carries him nearly where he has to go. The, the two, there are two monks who, who take them under the arm and say, now you go here, now you go there, because otherwise he would keep dancing around and, uh, with, you know. <laughs> but it just strikes me that, you know, we don't have a dictionary of Peharic. No. <laughs> yes, it is, I think, something that, um, in fact, yes, uh, actually, this is much more um, evident in the shamanic side, where the, this person assistant, which I was talking about earlier, uh, the village idiot, is the, the interpreter also for the, for the shaman, because the shaman, you know, speaks out things that are hardly understandable to anyone. Also, the, the, the stuff he recites when he goes into trance is not something really a language. Uh, he just, you know, at least most of them do like that. And so it's a very diffi difficult world to interpret. Of course, if you think that that it is possible that a lot of charlatanism is around. That's really the possibility. I think it's probably done in all good faith, actually, but nevertheless it may be that... In some cases, yes. I, I am not, you know, uh, I do not wish to uh, judge uh, how it is and how it is not. Yeah. I know, for example, that in Siberia or in, in the Mongolian uh, part, it's really mostly uh, they are charlatans because uh, their communism wiped everything out and uh, there is hardly any, uh, you know, this, these things also need the continuation of the nation. Like yeah, yeah, tuba and so forth. You can see it easily because they do trances for tourists and all that. For example, in the case of that oracle before, he was already uh, the, the his session was already scheduled when we arrived there, and uh, we were we asked him, can we participate, and they say, okay, no problem. This was the very in, uh, the very big advantage of Arunachal Pradesh at that time, and still it is a, in a certain way, because it had been, due to political reasons, it had been completely closed off from uh, any foreign influence, foreigners, uh, any Indian tourist also, which can be also distracting, and uh, um, missionaries, most importantly, Western missionaries were not allowed there because whatever you might think of them, they really destroyed cultures. Because, you know, they, they wiped things out and they get, make good Christians. And uh, um, so this one was really a pristine environment at the time. Most people had never seen a foreigner. And maybe some movie, but you know, in the, in the villages they had uh, like a television half like this and they uh, built a hut around it and that was the cinema. <laughs> and they put some, uh, what, what they call the v, v, VHS, the sets and this kind of thing. So, um, in fact, most of the people, they, they did not really care about your presence or and, and they did nothing whatsoever for your sake. They ignored us completely. And, and this was a, was a very good uh, environment to, you know, to, some, to participate, like kind of invisibly to the local life. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, 
Would you, the, the gentleman, um, or a colleague, you mentioned the medium, where is she now? Is she living in India? I think she passed, the, the one which was here, yeah. she passed away. Uh, she was already beyond uh, 80 and something, maybe 10 years ago. And I think, I'm not really sure, but uh, I think she passed away. So maybe a new one is now uh, somewhere. I think we've got no more questions. I yeah. hope we can finish because it's already half past eight okay. now. Uh, so, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to say, maybe it might, it might be uh, the, the reason why I put this here yeah. is this is a very symbolic, uh, for the shamans at least, very symbolic instrument. Um, the two faces have, uh, you know, uh, very, but um, one idea is that the shaman flies on, this is his airplane, so, and uh, cosmologically, this one is, uh, for example, one of the uh, possibilities, this is the uh, up and down movement of the sun, northern and southern in the, during the year. And because the drum is an instrument related very much to time, because rhythm is time. Okay, so playing the drum is something related with playing time. So when the drum becomes, yes, the tempo rises, is, is time itself becoming contracted or, or speeding up? No, no, not necessarily, but that is representing and uh, sort of connecting with the time flow. Well, I meant as a metaphor, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know where well, yeah, maybe it could be that when the tempo goes uh, faster, the time goes faster. This is a very interesting topic upon which I don't think it is uh, the case to touch now. But, uh, for example, the, the Dhamma, uh, particularly the form Shiva has in his right hand, is a, a how do you call that, uh, sand, sand watch, sand clock, sand watch? Some uh, Dhamma. No, no. Hourglass. Oh, well, an hourglass. And? Hourglass. Hourglass, yeah. It can be seen like that, but it's not now the, the, the moment to talk about. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.